She had us, both of us, absolutely round her finger. Fundamentally, she achieved this through the way she looked at us. It shouldn't have been a surprise that the way she moved her head to one side should leave me basically on my knees, or more akin, I should say, to a slightly tepid pool of just water. But what was more surprising was the effect it had on him. Anything she wanted, he gave her. Anything she demanded, he agreed to. And he agreed to everything with the same little smile on his face. The smile of a man who in actual fact is little more than four years old. I'm not saying I wouldn't have agreed to the same and more in his position, but it just seemed in some way more... What? Downright surprising? Coming from him, he wasn't that kind of a man. He was a soldier. When I say was, I mean was. I mean, he used to be between 1968 and 1984. He was a soldier in the British infantry. He reached the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He did five tours of Northern Ireland, and this was when, you know, doing a tour of Northern Ireland was more than just a few games of pool and a chat with some kids outside a fish and chip shop. <laughs> some of the photographs he took. He used to have a Polaroid camera, and some of the things that, after he'd had a few drinks, he'd get out of his box to show us. He wouldn't have thought they were of Northern Ireland. There was something about them I found in some way. You know, surprising. He always refused to talk about South Georgia. I asked him about it one time and his face turned, within a matter of a few seconds, literally grey. Slate grey. <laughs> Even when he eventually retired from the army, he retrained as a maths teacher, for Christ's sake. I would have liked to have seen him teach. I can imagine the sort of teacher he was. I don't think he'd have worn many cords. I don't think he'd have shared too many coffees with the sixth formers. Come and play with me. Read me a story. Can I sit on your lap? Where's Grandpops? Oh, there he is. It's not his kind of scene, you know? But he did it with her. The first thing I learned about photography, I learned when I was a kid, if you're taking a portrait photograph, if you possibly can, then take it from below the subject. It renders the subject. Actually, oddly what it does is it renders them not more heroic, not more godlike. Oddly, it renders them more human. And if you can take it in natural light, if you can capture the way the light falls at the start of or at the end of the day, especially, then it can be... He used to try to convince me that the existence of, the discovery of, and the understanding of the relevance and importance of the irrational number, which is commonly and internationally and historically known as pi, that is, to five decimal places, the number 3.14159, is irrevocable proof of the existence of God. <laughs> it's just so illogical, he told us, that it could ever work, that it must just prove that there's something more than us. And it's so incredible that we can discover it. That proves something. I think he's wrong. I told him, I think you're wrong. I told him, for somebody so palpably intelligent, Arthur, sometimes you think as though your head is full of wool. <laughs> he liked me. He never got too cross. We talk about beer together. He never bothered about me coming from... He watched an unusual amount of tennis. <laughs> Everything was tennis with him. His conversation was peppered with tennis metaphors. Sometimes I'd watch tennis with him. I never liked it much. Is it a terrible thing to say that sometimes the company of men can be kind of, in some ways, comforting? I don't mean it to sound, you know, I don't mean anything other than. <sighs> he had a house in the eastern suburbs of Toulon in a town called Cacheraine, in the south of fucking France, for fuck's sake. When I go there with Helen for the first time, we drive in her car. She's a kind of mix between being a bit embarrassed because 
ostensibly, at least at the time, were kind of, what, socialists? And just being really fucking proud because her dad has a house in the south of France and she's taken me there and she's paying for the ferry because I'm skinned. She keeps going on about how odd he is, but how she has a feeling that she thinks I like him. No idea. <laughs> That's one of the things she likes about me. She says, I like people. People like me. They think I'm gentle. I have absolutely no idea people thought I was gentle. And she says she really likes this bit. This bit is one of the best bits of a man, she says, which is a phrase <laughs> that just about sends me completely insane. I love her and her nose and her smile and everything. Lucy was a cesarean. And when Helen was in labour, there was a moment when I thought she could have died. <laughs> and I'm a little bit embarrassed now because I had to go into the toilets to change into my... What are they called? Scrubs. Just, when I had to change into my scrubs, I did have a bit of a cry. And when I did, I did ask God, who I don't fucking think is even there in the first place, to make sure that Helen was all right. I said, we can survive if we lose the baby, but I don't think I could make it if she went and died in me. It's a bit like talking to a photograph. Or the mirror. It has the same effect. Which isn't to discount it completely, but it's not God. The second time I go to his house, after we've been going out now for about two years, he takes me diving. He's become a big fan of scuba diving in the 18 months me and Helen have been going out, which is maybe a surprising character development for a man of his age, but he's a surprising man. Between Saint-Tropez and the Ile de Pocquerel, there are, he says, actual shipwrecks that you can actually dive on. Would I like to come? <laughs> I've never worn a wetsuit before, and it takes longer to get into than I'd have hoped. <laughs> it makes me feel a bit fat. He tells me he's gonna take me to the sea wall. I ask him, the what? He says, the sea wall. This makes no sense to me at all. There's a wall in the sea. It drops down hundreds of feet. I had no idea the bed of the sea was built like that. I thought it was a gradual slope. He brought us these little bags with bits of bread in to feed the fish. And you hold them upside down to swim with so you don't lose the bread because it naturally floats upwards. And he takes us to the wall. And swimming there with the sun, even bright as it is above us, and it's a bright day, even then the darkness of the fall that the wall in the sea reveals is as terrifying as anything I've seen. I get back to the surface, of course, and the idea that there ever wasn't a seawall down there in the first place is a bit embarrassing, frankly. I mean, what did I actually think the seabed was made of? When Helen's given birth to Lucy, the midwife calls over to me, Daddy, do you want to see your baby born? They built a little tent. And I look over the edge of the tent, and I, you know, I'm one of those people who, I never know where to look when people point things out to me. Like I'm a kid and I'm driving along and mum says, look, a kestrel, <laughs> or look, a plane. And I don't have the faintest idea what to look at. So I just smile and nod dumbly and say, oh yeah. But I'm completely lying. And this is a bit like that. Mainly I see the yellow of the inside of her stomach. Once you've seen the inside of somebody's stomach, I think your relationship with that person probably moves on to what? A new level? <laughs> I love her completely, with every bone and bit of skin of me. And it's been very rare the times in our relationship where she's cried and I've comforted her. I'm fucking crying all the fucking time. I can't watch an episode of ER without just being a wreck. I cry at ground force when the person comes back and they've had their garden done up.
we go there to his house for our holidays every year. We did used to drive. For three years straight, we drove all the way down from London without stopping. We took it in turns driving. We kind of promised to share the navigating, but neither of us needed any help. We did it fine. When Lucy was born, we started flying there, though, because the driving is not fair on a baby. And he buys the tickets. He can get flights to Kakas on for dead cheap, but he'd pay for us to fly into Nice, and he'd hire us a car when we got there. The first time he see, <laughs> sees her, he takes her by surprise a bit. He looms over from behind her, and he's wearing his glasses, big old <laughs> glasses, and he's a very, very tall man. And he takes her by surprise, and she screams like living shit, believe me. It took her about three weeks to recover from that. But she did. And then she starts with the shuffling across the floor to reach him <laughs> and putting her arms up and making these little noises, which basically mean, put me on your lap and read me a story now, you funny old fucker. I don't care if you're meant to be weird. I don't care if you're meant to be scary. I don't care what anybody fucking thinks about you. I want a story and I want it now. Who could resist that? She starts wearing cardigans then. And that's me done for. One time I say to him, if there's a God, is he a man? And the question catches him by surprise a bit, but after a while he says that yes, he thinks in the end God is probably a man. So I say to him, well, what does he look like? Does he have a beard? Does he wear robes? Does he have long white hair? And he says to me that the thing about God is, is that whatever you think he looks like, well, he will look the absolute opposite to that. And whatever I think he is least likely to look like, well, that is what he will look like. So I ask him if he means God looks a bit like Gary Glitter, and he tells me not to be so bloody silly. So I say to him, well, if you can't tell me what he looks like, if you don't know what he looks like and he doesn't look like anything, then how do you know that he's anything more than just an idea, just something you made up? She's eight. We've been going there every year. We've talked for years about having a second child, but every time we do, we just think about Lucy and just think, you know what, we're very happy. She's just, we just want her. She's clever, she's funny, she's very, very pretty. She's my sweetheart. She's Helen's sidekick. They make little wisecracks about me. The two of them stand there sizing me up. But I know if they ever push it too far, she'll come running over and put her arms around me because the idea of properly making me sad makes her feel a little bit sick. In the eight years she's been born, I fucked a lot of things up and somehow by the skin of my teeth managed to largely come out unscathed. And me and Helen, we're doing okay. You know, we have little routines and stuff like about the dishwasher or the shopping or the cooking because I really like to cook for her. But compared to her, I'm shit at it. So when she cooks, it's probably a treat. We have all these little routines, but it's like we fucking love them, you know, rather than finding them. What? Restricting. Sometimes when you swim in the sea, the force of the waves can crash right against you. It can knock you over. There have been times when just trying to get out of the sea, I've been knocked over. Two summers ago, this happened, and I cracked my coccyx against a stone on the shore's edge, and I flailed about like some kind of huge seal. <laughs> I was at that moment the mathematical polar opposite of Daniel Craig. It doesn't get like this normally where he is. Normally the sea's warm there. It's just quite an unusual feeling for me. I always swim out as far as I think is safe and then turn and then swim another 10 strokes and then stop and swim back. Sometimes you think the tides caught you. You panic because you think you're not moving. You are, you just need to turn on your back, collect your breathing, kick slowly, you're moving. I ask him, where is he? He says, who? I say, God, where is he? Is he in the sky? That's where people used to think he was children and medieval people. 
is he on the edge of our solar system? Is he on the edge of our galaxy? Because every time we think we've located where he must be, then we find out something else and we realize God can't be there. Is he 15 billion light years away in the very edges of our universe? In the parts of our universe that take on the form of the Big Bang? That, that kind of density? Is he there? Is that where he is? He says, we don't know everything, Alex. There are things we don't know. There are things we can't explain. I tell him now. He says, what? I say, we can't explain them now, but that doesn't mean they have no reason. It just illustrates the gaps in our knowledge. It doesn't mean we won't be able to explain them one day, because I really... Because Because I think we will. I want to acknowledge something. And it's embarrassing because it's something you'll have noticed. There's a hole running through the centre of my stomach. Must have felt a bit awkward because you can probably see it. Most people choose not to talk about it. Some people say that they're sorry, but they, yes, they can see my hole. What's that, Alex, they say. You appear to have a great big hole running right through the middle of you. I started doing okay, you know, I got a... It sounds stupid, but I got a contract with British Home Stores. I took the photographs for their websites and their catalogues, the menswear, the women's wear, the back to school stuff, the homeware. I made so much money taking photographs of Cushions and digital alarm clocks and saucepans. I can barely believe it myself. Five weeks ago, just before we go, just before all the packing and the frantic stuff about what are we going to take, Helen's buying some stuff to take with us. She's got Lucy all her new stuff. Her cozy and her dresses and her books and toys for the flight. And she's got me some shades, which are properly pucka. Seriously, very poncherello from chips. <laughs> and she asked me to come into the bedroom because of something she wants to show me. And I get there and she's wearing this dress. It's a blue dress with this dropped back. And she asked me to tell her what I think. I swear for about 30 seconds, I couldn't speak. She looked. The idea that I was married to her and that we had our girl and that this was our life. There's a man in the market in Poor Grimo that we visit on our second day there and he sells us a case of claret for the equivalent of about 15 quid and it's like heaven. We drink two bottles our second night there. The next day Helen has to go to the supermarket because she wants to get some bread and some shampoo for Lucy and I need some athlete's foot cream. <laughs> and we love it. They have these little, these little pots of vanilla flavoured yoghurt that you can't get in Britain and she wants to get some cheese. It's fun getting it from the market but as it goes it's a proper rip off so she wants to go to the supermarket which is where most of the French people go anyway. So me and Arthur go down with Lucy down to the sea. There's a bay just near his house and around the corner from the bay there's a little cove that you can climb on and climb onto and when the bay's busy you can go to this cove which is actually near his house and it's more secluded and it's very quiet and it's lovely and we talk about it and we decide to go there. She can go into this world. Does he ever know any kids like that? But she thinks nobody's looking. She can start off just going further and further into her imagination. <laughs> Playing games all by herself. Actually, what she's really doing is she's talking to herself, which some people might find a bit disconcerting, but I just love to watch her. He says to me one time, he looks at me, and he says, he's in the feeling of water. Sometimes there's the shape of the roll of the land. He's in the way some people move. He's in the light falling over a city at the start of an evening. He's in the space between two numbers.
You know what the cruelest thing I ever did to anybody was? I'll tell you. I've started getting into detective fiction. I have a friend who works at St. Mary's University and he said to me, Alex, all fiction is detective fiction. He's completely wrong. Jane Austen isn't detective fiction. Franz Kafka isn't detective fiction. Bridget Jones isn't detective fiction. Detective fiction is detective fiction. James Elroy. Arthur goes for a swim. I'm reading L.A. Noir, the bit where the cop and the killer are meeting in the car park at midnight with the lights off neither knowing whether the other one is there. Lucy's kind of being a Power Ranger. The sun is gorgeous. I've got my shades on. It's so bright. He comes back. The water's amazing, he says. He dries off. I notice his feet, the skin on his feet is unusually battered and cracked. It's one of those moments where you kind of rumble he's a little old. He tells me I can go for a swim. I do, and the water is amazing. I wade past the first bank, get past all the seaweed, and I swim out and out and out around the bay. And the light, at that time of day, light on the Mediterranean is, and the sea is warm. I turn around, and about 20 yards out, the sky is this huge blue curve. I can see all the houses on top of the road. I can see his house. I can see all the swimmers around the corner of the bay. I can see Arthur sitting there reading. He's reading some history of China. He's real into it. Towel draped over his leg, water dripping onto his book. I can see all of this from here with real detail. I can see Lucy playing behind him, running about a bit, playing Power Rangers. I can watch them as she does a little bit of a jump. And it's odd because he's so into his book that he doesn't notice that she loses her footing on the sand and the gravel of the rock there and she slips and she stumbles. And she's quite close to a little edge in one of the rocks there. And what she does is she tries to correct her balance, but in trying to correct her balance, she actually puts more weight on her back foot, which slips out from underneath her. And it's weird to look at because she does fall off the edge of the six foot high cliff and she falls backwards and she cracks her head against some rocks that, that are jutting out of the bottom of the cliff. I can see all of this clearly, but I can't really hear anything. And it's weird watching it with no sound. Like if the sound's off on the telly, it's always a bit strange. It takes a while to register before I turn and swim back to the shore. I'm not thinking, so I start swimming faster and faster, which is stupid because I'm panicking. When you panic, you can't really breathe properly. So to tell myself, concentrate on your breathing. I can kind of watch him between strokes and he's thrown down his book and jumped off the cliff. And there's one other couple that I hadn't noticed there that are stopped their sunbathing and ran over towards where she is. And I noticed him pick her up. He's torn between running back to the house to call an ambulance and waiting for me. I get there in enough time for him not to have to worry about this for too long. I go to her. I take her from him. There's what there is, which is surprising to me, is there's a handful of blood in her hair. It's thick and matted and her hair's all chewed up by it. I read that it's a process that is never absolutely instantaneous. The injury causes the death of brain cells, so signals are no longer sent to the lungs and bit by bit the machine closes down. Her blood sticks to my hands. I carry her up the path of the cove and I haven't bothered getting dried and people are looking at me, stopping still in their tracks and talking to me in French. And I'm aware that I'm kind of not crying. I look like, fuck, I don't know. I go back into the house with her and as I'm carrying her through the sliding glass doors, I bang her head against the wall and I'm talking to her, which is stupid. And I tell her that I'm sorry for banging her head, but there was part of me that's thinking, well, fuck it now. What does it fucking matter now? You might as well drag her by her fucking ankle. This bit of meat, this bit of meat and air. I remember I was a bit astonished because one of the ambulance men spoke English. Quite good English. He lived in Southampton. And I couldn't help thinking, why the fuck did you live in Southampton of all places? The sound of her 
closing the door with her bags full of shampoo and cheese and bread takes me completely by surprise. She looks at me across the house. She's wearing sunglasses to protect her against the light. Jesus fuck. He's sitting on the sofa, still wrapped in his towel. He is a man that is completely broken. He's a shattered form. The little noises he makes. I lean over the desk at the check-in at Nice and we'd been taken to the front of the queue and we'd actually been given an upgrade. <laughs> and while the woman was sorting this, I look over at the sheet she was checking off on her desk and there was a list of the passengers and the crew and the baggage and at the end of the list it read human remains, which was a bit. We're sitting there, the three of us, in the departure lounge. We can't really touch one another, we can't look at one another or at anybody else. I turned to him, and this is the cruelest thing I ever did to anybody. And don't forget, this is a man I, you know, I've known him for 10 years. And I, 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 I do, I love him. I turned to him. I say to him, You get back to London, of course, and the noise of the place, and the dirt, and the colour, and the roar of it. I can't actually. What I can't do for now, at least, is work. There's a lie at the heart of photography that I've always cherished. When you take a photograph, what you do is you free something that is actually alive. To do this properly, you need, more than anything, to believe in life. There's a child outside the window laughing, and in his laugh there's absolutely no joy or humour. Warning, this vehicle is reversing. <laughs> I have a complete and total inability to cry. <laughs> You see, when people say to you that they can't imagine not believing in anything because it would just be too depressing, I think there's something sick about that. The level of cowardice in that is just unbearable. <sighs> to me. I've been home for three weeks. If this can happen, anything can happen. Just now there was this couple on the street and they were arguing on the street and it looked like they were trying to copy characters out of soap operas as if the closest they'll ever get to being famous is arguing on the street as if they're actually on EastEnders. The misery and the emptiness and the vacuous fucking shitness of their lives is so considerable that the proximity to the behavior of soap characters acts as some kind of consolation.
Helen moves around the house. <laughs> I'm holding my entire head together. The skin and the shell of me. I'm falling absolutely inside myself. But you can see that. You can see that. In my Just because we don't know doesn't mean we won't know. We just don't know yet. But I think one day we will. I think we will. <laughs>